I can hear my grandmother, she would say, I wouldn't have a religion I couldn't feel sometimes. Every now and then, it ought to get good to you, and it ought to move you to at least say amen. If you, if you grew up Presbyterian, you might be a little uncomfortable, uh, but I just want to get you ready for heaven, because in heaven, I'm just going to tell you, we're going to be singing, shouting, and some of you just going to be nodding, and that's all right. Just nod in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give God one more praise in this place. Ah, it's so good. So good. If you have your Bibles, would you meet me in John 17? John 17. Whew, I'm too fat to be dancing like that. John 17. Here as we hear the words of Jesus as he prays for his disciples, parenthetically, he also prays for you and I. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much. Father, thank you for this great church. Thank you for your hand of grace and mercy who watches over us, holds us together. Father, your children have gathered to listen. So would you speak, O oh Lord? Tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. The year was 1922, there in Minneapolis. This young couple gave birth to a little boy by the name of Charles. Charles would grow up and they would clearly early on identify that he had a special, unique gift. Um, you could give Charles a piece of paper uh, and a pen and some coloring, crayons, and he, he would just create some of the most beautiful little pieces of art. They knew he had a gift, and he would grow up, and he would hone his gift, and he would become an exceptional cartoonist. We would all come to know him as Charles Schultz. One of his more famous cartoon sketches was what we commonly know as Peanuts. The Peanut Gang consisted of some of our favorite characters, uh, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, uh, Linus, uh, and our homegirl Lucy. Uh, <laughs> Lucy was one of my favorites. Um, as a matter of fact, one of my favorite cartoons features uh, a dialogue between Lucy and Linus. Uh, Linus was this sleepy little boy who held on to his blanket, struggled to stand up for himself. So it's interesting, this 
the sketch, he's sitting and he's watching TV with the remote control in his hand, and Lucy just comes and snatches it out of his hands and just takes it and starts changing the channel. Linus stands up for himself. He says, what gives you the right to come in here and take that remote out of my hand? Who do you think you are? What gives you the right to just come and take something out of my hand like that? What gives you the right? Lucy said, you want to know what gives me the right? I'll tell you what gives me the right. One, two, three, four, and five. Separate it. They don't look that intimidating. But when they come together, (laughs) they create a formidable foe. Linus, defeated, intimidated, drops his head. He walks away, looks at his hand, and says, Now, why can't y'all come together like that? (laughs) As Jesus has gathered his disciples, he's there and he takes time to pray. And the nature and the tenor of his prayer can be found in Linus' words. He's praying that you and I, those that have heard the message, those that follow Jesus, those that name the name of Jesus Christ, those that are part of his family, his sons and his daughters, he's praying that all that we would come together. And when we come together in oneness and unity, we become a formidable foe against the ills of the world and we come together as a proclamation to the world that there's a God who loves them, there's a God who knows them, there's a God who desires to be with them. He says, I pray that my children will become one. They won't be divided. The enemy's greatest ploy, his greatest tactic is that he could divide us, divide us along race, divide us along uh, gender, divide us along politics, divide us along uh, uh, economic class. Jesus says, that's why I prayed for you. Because divided... It's going to be hard to make impact. But oh, if my sons and daughters will come together in oneness and unity, they can change the world. They can change the world. So he prays that we will become one. Recognize that one, oneness is not about a person, but it's about a purpose. So oneness is not the end. It's the means to the end. Our oneness helps us point to the one. Oh, that was good. Let me say that again. I'm going to just say that again. <laughs> our, our oneness points to the one. It, he says when we come together in oneness and unity, it sends a message to the world. It sends a message to those who don't know him. It sends a message to those who have been living absent the love of God. When we come together, it sends a message to say there's a God who loves them. So our oneness lends us to a greater purpose and a greater mission. And that is so that the world might know that he is God. He loves them and he desires a relationship with them. Jesus, when he prays for this oneness, he says, Lord, make them one like we are one. He says, he says make them one like, like we are one. In other words, he gives us a description. We don't have to figure out what oneness looks like. He says, I'm going to show you. It looks like what me and the Father have. You got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Son was always there. Don't think that Jesus just showed up in the book of Matthew. In the book of Genesis, God the Son was always there. After sin broke, broke relationship for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that we might have hope and salvation through Jesus Christ. So he says, when you think about the oneness, Father, I want them to have oneness like we have oneness. Uh, they, they exist in the, their triune God. 
uh, homoousia. Homoousia is the idea of, uh, of same substance, distinct persons, but same substance. Tony Evans says it this way. If you take, a, if you take a, a, one of those baked uh, uh, pretzels, y'all know the baked pretzels that they sell, that you can just dip, dip them in cinnamon and sugar. Lord have mercy. Ooh, this thing is good. He says, he says a pretzel, three distinct holes, but connected with the same dough. That's the Trinity. I thought that was good. I thought it was. Tony said it was good. It's, it's the idea of the, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son, same substance connected together, three distinct persons, but they've got a dynamic to their relationship. Their, their oneness has dynamics to it, and he says, Lord, make them one like our oneness. Let, let's, let's invite them into what we have. So it's important for us to understand the oneness of God. It's important for us to understand the dynamic of the oneness of God so that we might know what it is to walk in oneness with God. I've got four points I want to bring to you today to help us understand the oneness of God. Uh, four points to help us understand the oneness of God. Most preachers have three, but I'm an overachiever. I got four. Uh, <laughs> to help us understand the oneness of God. First, in order for us to understand the wonder of God, the, the oneness of God, we've got to understand the truth of the Father. Uh, the truth of the Father. You've got to recognize that although they're a triune God and they're existing in three persons, there is an honor to the Father. There is a surrendering to the Father. We see it in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is saying, Lord, if it be, uh, uh, let this cup pass from me. Uh, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You see his surrender and his submission to the will of the Father? God, if it was up to me, we'd skip over this crucifixion, bring some angels down, and we'd turn up for a little while and then pull me up out of here. It's kind of, you know, it's not, that part's not really in the Bible. It's an Albert Tate translation. But, um, <laughs> but, but he says, but it's not about me. It's not about my will. It's not about what I want. I look to the Father for truth. I look to the Father for your will to be done, and I live my life in submission to the truth that is the Father. It's kind of like this. There was an admiral in the United States Navy. He was navigating a ship, and they're going along in the ocean, and they see this bright light, which indicated that there was a ship coming towards them, and they were on the same line of trajectory, which would mean if they kept going at the same course, they would then have impact with one another. They would, they would intersect with one another. So he got on the, on the, on the, on the, on the what do you call it? The, uh, what? The, radio. the radio, yeah, sure. The radio. He got on the radio and he says, this is, this is an admiral of the U.S. Navy uh, ship, uh, Carolina 199. Uh, that's not really what it was called, but I just had to make something up in the moment. Um, uh, ship Carolina 199. Um, we are... We are set on the same course. I need you to adjust your position south. I need you to adjust your position south. Uh, and then on the radio, a voice came back and says, uh, uh, unfortunately, no, we cannot adjust our position south. We need you to adjust your position north. I said, uh, excuse me, you obviously didn't hear me. I said, we're set on the same course, and I need you to adjust your position south. Yeah, unfortunately, we cannot adjust our position south. We need you to adjust your position north. The admiral got frustrated. He said, listen, I'm an admiral in the United States Navy, and I said, adjust your position south. And he got back and says, well, I am the lighthouse, and you need to adjust your position north. <laughs> Albert, what's the moral of the story? The lighthouse don't adjust to the, to the position of a ship. The ship adjusts to the position of the lighthouse. What am I trying to tell you? Jesus Christ, the Father, is the truth, and the truth don't adjust to your lifestyle. Your lifestyle has to adjust to the truth. Oh, we live in a time when we feel like we can make this fit where we are, how we are, where, when we are, and what we want to be. No, 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 no. This book don't adjust to you. You need to adjust to this book. You got to adjust to this book. Jesus says you need to understand the truth of the Father. If we're going to be oneness, you need to know that there is one who sets the course for us all. 
in order for you to take that in, he says there has to be a sense of immersion. Listen to the language. He says, Father, I want them to be like us. Like, I'm in you and you're in me. There's a sense of saturation. There's a sense of being so immersed into his presence to where I'm in him and he's in me, and there's a sense of oneness with us because of the saturation, because of the immersion. Yeah, uh, uh, y'all not getting it. Let me see if I can say it another way. Um, as a little boy, I used to watch my granddaddy, and he had a big old fireplace, and he had these big old logs in the fireplace, but he'd have this iron poke that he'd poke in the fire. And it was amazing because I'd be a little boy, and I'd watch him poke that thing with the fire, and he'd pull it out, and the fire was in the poke. It'd be red hot, and you can just see this black metal object. Now the fire is in it, and you can see it red hot gazing. The poke was in the fire. The fire was in the poke. Uh, Y'all not getting it. Let me see if I say it another way. (laughs) I remember one time I was washing dishes, and I noticed I had a cup in my hand, and I put the cup in the water, and the water was in the cup cup was in the water, water was in the cup, poke was in the fire, fire in the poke. I'm in the father, the father's in me. Are 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 y'all with me in here? He he says with your relationship with God, you've got to get in his presence. And if you get in his presence, his presence will get into you. He says, if, if, you, if you get into his thoughts, oh, his thoughts will get into your thoughts. And he, he begin to shape you. That's why you got to study this book. That's why you got to pray. That's why you got to worship. That's why you got to come together in the community of faith. Because in that process, he transforms you. He changes you. He renews your mind. Here's a good old holiness term. He's sanctifying you. He's sanctifying you. He's taking everything that's not like him and purifying you. He's changing you. And out of this immersion, he, he begins to, to shift and align your life. You, you, you align your life according to his life. You, you, you tune your life according to his key. Uh, you, you find yourself tuned according to his will. It, it, it's kind of like this. I wanna, I, I'm inspired. I want to ha- start the, the Willow Creek Mass Choir. Uh, We're going to start it right now. I need y'all to help me sing. So y'all sit up, sit up, wake up the person sitting next to you. Although with a black brother preaching like this, I don't know how you're sleeping. Uh, you must be. <laughs> let me tell you something. If you can sleep through this, you tired. You need to sleep. You just go on. <laughs> Just go on, lay on down. Don't, don't do none of this nodding stuff. That's distracting. If you're going to sleep, just get in the aisle. Just knock out. Because if you can sleep in this, you deserve a nap. Uh, I, I want to I I get a little quiet. So uh, on the count of three, I want everyone to sing the word ah. All right? I just want you to sing the word ah. Okay? Now listen, don't have me start in this choir and embarrass me by singing all soft. I need y'all to get loud. I need y'all to come with it, all right? Are y'all ready? Up in the balcony, y'all ready? Y'all gonna come with it? All right, okay, all right, all right. Uh, uh, and, and listen, if you're watching online, I need you to do it too. Don't be sitting up lazy in your pajamas, sipping tea, <laughs> just think you're just gonna watch and not participate. No, I need you to sing ah too. If you gotta wake the kids up, wake them up. I, I need you to sing ah, okay? Are y'all ready? All right, one, two, three. That was terrible. <laughs> that was terrible. You know why it was terrible? Everybody was singing in their own note. Everybody singing in their own key. Everybody tuned themselves to their own voice. And when you tune yourself to your own voice, you don't sound like oneness. You don't sound like unity. You sound like you. And what I want you to see is God isn't calling us to sound like you. He's calling us to sound like him. So what we have to do with our lives is not tune our lives to ourselves. We got to tune ourselves to the key of God. You understand what I'm saying? Now watch this. We all diverse. All our voices sound different. We just heard. All our voices sound different. We all different. But what happens if we, all the same people in the room, but we tune 
to a key. And we all align our voices to that key. Like this, Tracy, give me a key. Give me a good key. That's good, that's good, that's good. That's good. Y'all got, got your key? Get your key. All right. On the count of three. One, two, three. Ah. Is this the same people? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> See, it makes a diff big difference, and that's the vision of oneness. All different. But when we all tune to the same key, we have a sound that is unified and one. Let, let's do it one more time. But this time, after you say ah, let's go into amazing grace. Can we do that? Come on, give me the key. Here we go. One, two, three. our oneness, may the world hear and experience the melodic tone of God's amazing grace through our lives. He says, Lord, make them one so that the world will hear that I love them, I've chosen them, and that there is a grace for them. Our oneness speaks to the grace of God. Not only do you need to experience the truth of the Father by which we align ourselves to his truth, we adjust to the lighthouse, we immerse ourselves in his presence, but number two, we need the glory of the Father. In order to understand the oneness of God, we need to understand and experience and know the glory of the Father. Jesus says of the disciples, he says, I've already given them the same glory that you've given me. Now, you got to know when we talk about the glory of God, we're talking about the good stuff. We're, we're talking about the express splendor of God. We're talking about the stuff of God that causes awe and wonder. We're, we're talking about when God shows up and shows out. We, we're, we're talking about when God just, just, just outdoes itself, when he leaves you speechless, when he shows up in a major way. He says, I've given them the glory. I've given them the splendor. I, they've, they've seen an invisible. God revealed in miraculous and powerful ways. You want to see the glory of God, the Red Sea, when it parted. That's the glory of God. Dead Lazarus rises up from the dead. That's the glory of God. Jairus' daughter raised from the dead, and he tells her, go get us something to eat. And she sitting over there eating macaroni and cheese. That's the glory of God. Y'all, if you really want to see the glory of God, I dare you to look around. Willow, after all the hell you you've been through, you still here, the lights are still on, the doors are still open, you're still serving, you still baptizing, look around, this is the glory of God, this is the glory of God, the glory of God, the enemy tried to take you out. You should have given up a long time ago, but look at you, you're still standing. You're still believing. You're still hoping. You're still holding on. Willow, this is the glory of God. Oh, come on, you ought to praise him for his glory. You ought to give him praise for his glory. You could have been down and out, but here you are up and in. You ought to give him glory right now. He's been too good. He's been good to you, Willow. He's still holding you together. He's still holding you up. Willow, he's been good. This is the glory of God. Hallelujah. Ah. 
because this is the glory of God. It's the express, express splendor and wonder of his might. He says, I'm praying that they'll know the glory that they already have. Why is he praying that they will know the glory that they already have? Because he knows what's to come. And he knows. Jesus is praying this prayer. If you just turn the page, he's about to be arrested. And then he's about to be crucified. This is his last prayer with them before they take him away. Before it all starts. Before the pain starts. Before the injustice is unleashed. He's looking at them, praying for them. And he knows that they're about to fail him. He knows that they're about to reject him. But he says, although they're going to fail me, although they're going to reject me, although they're going to pass some hard times, they've already got the glory of God. What are, you, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that Jesus is praying that you would remember, even in the midst of a difficult story, you still have God's glory. Even in hard times, the glory is still there. I, I guess it's kind of like this. Let me explain it this way. I, um, I love pound cake. I, I, I love pound cake. Uh, and I remember being a little boy, watching my grandmother make pound cake from scratch. From scratch. I, I didn't know cake came in a box until I got married. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know nothing about that. No, 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 no. I mean, it's fine. My wife just said, sit down and shut up and you're going to eat this cake. And I did. Um, but, but my grandmother made it from scratch and I sit and watch her make it from scratch. And I'm just being a little boy, really trying to put it all together in my mind. I didn't understand how it worked. Because it looked like she was putting a bunch of disgusting things in a bowl. And I didn't understand how these disgusting things were going to turn out good. Like she'd have raw eggs. Let's put it in a bowl. I'm like, that's, that's nasty, Grandma. Nobody do, I'm not going to eat no raw eggs. Like, what are you doing? This ain't breakfast. What, what's happening? <laughs> then she take flour, which is this dry, powdery substance. You putting powder in the cake? Vanilla extract. Uh, and and she put, take a whole stick of butter and just throw a stick of butter in there. I was like, ah, oh, I'm out. I cannot do it. <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? All these things individually disgusting. Like, no one is going to ever just say, hey, give me a glass of raw eggs, unless you're trying to be Rocky, and he didn't even do it. He had a stunt double. He didn't even do it himself. Like, <laughs> nobody takes a hand of a, 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 a flour and be like, yeah, give, give me some of this flour. I'm going to need some water. Uh, <coughs> like, nobody does that. Nobody takes a stick, so, stick of butter like, Girl, I've been waiting all day. This. <laughs> like nobody does that, right? Because it's disgusting. But I watched my grandmother. She take all those nasty ingredients. She get the mixer, and then she start working that thing. She just beat it and work it and work it, and then she fill her cake pans. And if any of y'all from the south, y'all know what comes next. After she get it all done, she give you the spoon and the remnants of the bowl. Come on in here. Now, I got a witness up in here. And, she, and she'll pass it, and she'll be like, y'all want some? And as a kid, I was like, my first time, I was like, no, I'm not on that nasty stuff. It looked rough. But the old, older kids, they was already hip to the game. They was licking it and, like, singing. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> like that. It looked like that's good. And I tasted it. And it was good. It was delicious. All those negative things, all those nasty ingredients worked together and created something good. If you get it early, I won't have to preach as long. 
Romans 8, 28 says, although you have some negative things in your life, you take bitterness in your life and failure and guilt and mistakes and all of that, and you think you're done. Some of you came in here with burdens and you think it's over, but I'm telling you, the mixing hand of God will start working all things together. And once he works it together, he will work it, and then he will say, here, taste and see that the Lord is... Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. He says, I'm working it out. You think your marriage is on the rocks, but he says, if you just invite my hand, I'll work it out. You think your job is up on on a bad season, but if you put my hand in it, I'll work it out. You think your kids have lost their mind, but you put my hand on them, I'll work it out. I guess I'm telling you, you need to know that God's hand in your mess will make it together for your good. Ah, I dare you just to go in your house where all the burdens are and sit in the middle of your den and just say, dare you to walk in your children's room right in the middle of the junkiness and just say, in the name of Jesus. I dare you to, while your spouse is sleeping, just wake up, lay over them and just go. Next time your mother-in-law come in, when she go in the bathroom, stand at the bathroom door and just say, he's working it out for your good. He says, says, I want you to see my glory. But in order for you to see my glory, you got to be willing to allow me to redeem the elements of your story. He says, in order for us to be one, we need to know the truth of the Father, the glory of the Father. Thirdly, the sufficiency of the Father. Uh, Simply put, you just got to know God is enough. He's all you need. Don't experience the oneness of God and try to leave the oneness looking for something else outside of what God has provided. If David was here, he'd tell you, the Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, I shall not want. Why? Because my shepherd has provided all that I need. Here's the implication. If the shepherd ain't providing it, then I ain't wanting it. Don't want nothing outside of what the shepherd has provided. Some of you, your problem is you want too much stuff, and it's not what the shepherd has provided. And you need to be reminded that the sufficiency of God is all you need. See, it happens in the eyes. You start looking at other stuff. Ask Peter. Peter would tell you, I was walking on water. I was doing the impossible until my eyes start looking other ways. Ask Eve. Eve will tell you, you, I was experiencing complete oneness with God. Genesis 2, Adam and Eve chilling, eating grapes, drinking uh, uh, religious appropriate drinks. And... (laughs) And they are, the Bible says they are naked and not ashamed. They sit and chilling naked in the garden and not ashamed. It's kind of like how some of y'all was on vacation last time. You know what I mean? You just not ashamed. You just out there chilling. How long do you think that lasted? Not even, not even a half a page. You turn your Bible to the next page, you see the fall happen immediately. Why? Because her eyes started looking at fruit and not the Father. Oh, that was good. I'm going to say that again. Her eyes started looking at fruit and not the Father. Here's the question. Are you looking at fruit or are you looking at the Father? Are you looking at what your hands can get or are your eyes consumed on the one that gives you life? Because here's the reality, friends. If you don't understand this, you need to get this. What you behold, you will become. Did you get that? I said, what you behold, you will become. So it's not about what you're reaching for. What are you looking for? What, what, what are you looking at? Some of you are reaching for more money, reaching for all these other things. What are your eyes on? Fix your eyes on Jesus. What are you beholding? Because that's going to dictate what you are becoming. You're wondering, you keep looking at money, and you're wondering why you're becoming greedy. You keep looking at women, and you're wondering why you're becoming lustful. (laughs) 
Hello and here's somebody. You keep looking at Instagram and other people's lives and wonder why you're becoming insecure. Oh, I'm, this is good to me. I don't know if it's good to you, but I am preaching up in here now. Do you understand what I'm saying? You looking at Mary and all her life and all her beautiful pictures, then you look at your family and be like, we ain't even nothing. We can't even get pictures. But what you don't know is it took Mary 27 takes to get that one picture. Do you understand what I'm saying? You looking at her family all, and behind, after the picture was over, she whooped everybody and sent everybody to bed, <laughs> including her husband. <laughs> what are you beholding? My, my son... My, my son, he was born premature, um, so, so around eight, nine months, the doctor discovered that he, he has some physical delays, um, and, and we, we've been noticing because by now he should be scooting and beginning to crawl, uh, but, but he's not. His core is not strong physically, so um, they sent us to a physical therapist for babies. I didn't know they had that. Physical <laughs> therapies. For babies. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking this is physical therapy. You know, therapy that's physical. So it's physical therapy. So my son, he doesn't really pick up toys, and he doesn't, he, he's not, he doesn't reach for stuff right. So I said, it's physical therapy. Let me help him. So I'm at home getting his arms, helping him reach and grab toys and do that. So I go to the doctor. I said, Doc, I've been getting him ready for physical therapy. Therapy by, by, by sure. And I was showing the doctor, I take his hands and I put it on stuff. I take his hands and I do that. So, doc, I've been getting it ready for you. The doctor said, Albert, stop doing that. I said, what's up? He says, no, 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 no. He said, Albert, you, you're doing it all wrong. You, you don't do his hands. I said, but doc, it's physical therapy. So I need to work with his hands. He says, no, 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 no. If you want him to reach for something, you got to understand your son Micah, babies, they reach with their eyes first. I said, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> what you mean? They reach with their eyes first. He says, they reach with their eyes, and after they see it, then desire rises up, and then intent moves their hands. I said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, watch this, watch this. Instead of putting a toy at his hands, put it at his eyes. So my, my son, chubby cheeks, eyes, he, he teething, so he be drooling, his mouth be hanging open. So he's sitting there. <laughs> and the doctor put the toy right in front of his eyes. And I said, Doc, this ain't going to work. His, you got to put it in his hand. He said, he says, Albert, shut up. Um, I, said, oh, shut up. I said, okay. So he puts the toy there. And y'all, my son, true story, he sees the toy. And he starts looking, and then you can almost see desire coming up till his brain. And then intent says, hands, go get it. And all of a sudden, he starts. And he grabs the toy. He grabs it with his eyes. God is saying, fix your eyes on me. Stop reaching for stuff with your hands, but if you just do like my son Micah and start looking to God, and as you set your eyes on God, desire for godly things will come out, and then that'll shape your hands and what you reach for, and instead of reaching for stuff, you'll start reaching for God, reaching for his provision, reaching for his will, reaching for his power, reaching for his love, reaching for his presence. Anybody here ready to reach for God? Anybody willing to reach for God? If you want to reach for him, put your eyes on him. Put your eyes on him. Once you see him, he shapes what you grab. Come on, can we just tell the truth? Some of you grabbing the wrong thing. Some of you got the wrong thing in your hands because you got the wrong thing in front of your eyes. What are you looking at? If you want to experience this oneness, you got to know that God has all you need. So put your eyes on him so that what you behold, you will become. Third and finally, as we go home on this one, 
not just the truth of God, not just the glory of God, not just the sufficiency of God. But I think very simply, he wants you to know, if you want to pursue this oneness, you can't do it by yourself. You can't go alone. You can't experience this powerful revival and spiritual connection with God and then walk out of these church doors and go back in isolation. It's, this oneness is not predicated on a person. It's for a people. And in order for us to fulfill the mission, we've got to be a people showing the world the oneness of God, not a person showing the oneness of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it flies in the face of our culture that says, I got mine, you got to get yours. Oh, no. If somehow I got mine, then mine is yours. It is yours. So it's not just about my survival. I need you to survive. It's not just about my family winning. I need your family to win. Not about, not about, that's why we can't get caught up in Republican and Democrat and all that. Because I need everybody to survive. Because when we survive as a people, when we show up in the world as people that don't look alike, don't live alike, don't vote alike, but we got one God that makes us all alike, bringing us together for his glory, it becomes a witness to the world of his love. Look what God can do when he brings the people together. So I need you, and you need me, because we're all a part of God's body. So we got to stand up for one another. We got to agree with this vision. We're all a part of God's family. It is his will that every one of our needs be supplied in his sufficiency. Here's the declaration. You are important to me, and I need you to survive. How are we going to do it? I'm going to pray for you. You're going to pray for me because I love you, and I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I ain't going to talk behind your back. I ain't going to talk in front of your back. I'm not going to speak words that harm you. Why? Because I love you. Church folk ought to learn this one. Come on and hear somebody. I'm not going to talk about because I love you. And I need you to survive. Amen? Amen. There's a song that I want y'all to learn and get it in your hearts. It simply says, I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God. Says, stand with me. Agree with me. Because we're all a part. His will, I love this part. It says, You are important to me, and I need you. You are important. Here we go. Here's how we do it. I pray. I love you. I need you. I won't harm you with words from my mouth because I love you and I need you. Come on, let's take it up. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you and I need you. You just grab your neighbor's hand, grab your neighbor's hand. Stretch across the aisle. Stretch across the aisle. Grab your neighbor's head. I need you. Take it up. I pray for you. Grab those hands. Grab those hands. Stretch across the aisle. Stretch across the aisle. Come on. Stretch across the aisle. Grab those hands. There you go. I love you. Take it up one more time. Come on. I pray for you. 
It is his will. You are important. And I need you. Hallelujah. Grab that neighbor's hand real quick. Stretch across the aisle. Stretch across the aisle. Up in the back of y'all, stretch across the aisle. Listen, if you ever wanted to know what oneness looks like, if you ever wanted to know what the church should look like, if you ever know what unity should look like, I'm ready to show it to you. Somebody, somebody I'll take a picture and put it on Instagram. I'm going to show you. Somebody out a hashtag. Unity. Here it is. Y'all want to see it? Here it is right quick. Lift those arms up. Now look around. That's the unity of the church. That's a physical representation of who God's called us to be. White folks, black folks, Asian folks, Latino folks, Republicans, Democrats, confused people, all of us right here together saying we're coming together as a formidable foe against things that the enemy would try to send. We are greater than our division. We are greater than the walls. We are the body of Christ. We are the church of Jesus Christ and God has called us to be one. Let those hands go and put them together and give God praise. Hey! So Lord, would you make us one? Father, would you make us one as you and the Father are one? May we, may we know the truth of the Father, the glory of the Father, the sufficiency of the Father, and may we not go alone. May we go together, together for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Willow. So uh, Albert has to run and catch a flight back to California because I think it's too cold here for him. But we owe him a huge thank you. Can you say thanks as he walks out? Yeah. 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 And we've been very blessed today. Choir, you served us so well. Can we say thank you? Thanks for leading us in worship. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Now, a couple things. We're doing baptism next Sunday. And some of you are Christ followers. You haven't been baptized. This is what you got to do next. The meeting board's going to be right here. Just come down right after. It's take 10 minutes. Our prayer room's open right through those doors. If you need prayer, just stop by there. This is the last week of our readings through John. So if you fell behind, jump into the last week, finish strong, and we'll close it out this next week. And uh, the choir's going to do one more tune. So if you got kids in Promised Land, take a couple minutes, enjoy, but have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. And we'll see you back next week. Sound good? Blessings, everybody. Take care.